when we were analyzing this, there was always this question that you are looking at the exposure at the time of diagnosis. What do you know about the concentration of these heavy metals earlier uh, in terms of when the child was born? Uh, perhaps if do you have any data from mothers and so on? And this was always a limitation for us. So what we did was we said, okay, this cohort, J kids cohort, provide an opportunity to jump in and now get some cord blood from this uh, group of children and, and assess the concentration of these metals and PCBs and other metals, that, other uh, toxins that we were trying to analyze. And then later on, we follow up on the GA kids, the same kids, and reassess when they are at the age of two to eight. So that's how we got into this. What you're gonna be seeing today is, we have not really completed the follow up of, uh, the, this was a sub study of 144 children with cord blood information. And we had to do the follow up and we have not yet completed that aspect. Uh, so, so what you're going to be seeing here is this, that, okay, so what we did was, because we had the data from the cord blood, uh, we have already analyzed data for the heavy metals and factors associated with uh, heavy metals in cord blood of Jamaican children, uh, and we had another paper, which was also with the PCB, just to have uh, basic levels reported. So these are published into two manuscripts and uh, they're already out there and they're accessible that I will give you the citation at the end because I'm gonna show you a lot of data and you may not be able to absorb all of this today but the good news is, is that all of these are there documented that you can read. So, so for the sake of this presentation, we kind of combine these two and say that we are going to the objective of this study was to uh, characterize the concentration of heavy metals and core plot and PCBs and also pesticides in serum, is measured in serum of Jamaican children, newborns, and to explore possible association between these concentration and birth outcomes. So, so the information about uh, GA kids have been presented and with uh, the number that you will see here in this graph, uh, we use 9600 mothers and that may be all their data that we have familiar. Professor Sam's uh, in her presentation presented 9,700. So, so that information, whatever has been presented is the uh, information that we have. But what, was, what we were interested in is this, in this 144 cord blood uh, that they turned out to be, three of them were twins, so we had 147 newborns and 144 mothers. Uh, and we had these specimens from them. Uh, so, so you need to keep in mind that this data was collected in a hurry because we had this three months period of time to get uh, IRB approval and all of this. And some of the children actually fell out of that three months range of uh, that GA kids was collecting data. So some kids, uh, they didn't have uh, the GA kid information and we had to enroll 144 for the sake of the contractual agreement that we had. So, so you will see that uh, in this uh, data set that we will be showing you, uh, there are for heavy metals, uh, which include uh, lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, manganese, and aluminum, uh, there are 100 uh, of these and some data uh, is lost, uh, either we were not able to link to the JKIDS information, or they may have been broken when we transferred to Michigan, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services for analysis of this. The serum and analyzed for uh, fewer people, uh, we had, still, so for PCB and OC pesticide, we had data on 64 mothers and 67 newborns, and uh, either it was not adequate to be analyzed, and these are very expensive analysis, so each set of PCB that they will analyze, it's like $400 in the US. Uh, and uh, so altogether, this is an expensive study, uh, but we have made the best out of what we have. So, so now that I've told you about the history of uh, this study, I'm gonna go right into uh, presenting the data, really, 
and uh, that is uh, the so some of these metals uh, when you analyze you have limit of detection LOD and uh, so these uh, limits of detection and what percentage of them they, f they fall below the limit of detection that means they are low levels but you are, they are lower than the report in here uh, so s when you analyze this heavy metals data uh, you usually take a log transformation. If you had to take a log transformation to make them look normal distribution because usually they're skewed. And uh, lead, mercury, and aluminum, they were transformed. But uh, manganese uh, usually is normal distribution, so we didn't have to transform manganese. So we talked about a uh, set of birth outcomes. Uh, so we were looking at birth weight, uh, uh, so length, head circumference, APCOR score at one minute, APCOR score, and gestational age, these are the variables that we were able to uh, link. And uh, so we did some univariable and multivariable uh, linear regression to control for potential, uh, we used multivariable regression to control for potential confounding by maternal education and uh, SES, social economic status. So this is uh, uh, basic characteristics of the study sample that we had for the 100 um, families, mothers, uh, that they had heavy metals data. Uh, so, so we use uh, uh, whether they own the car or not uh, as, a as a simple measure of, uh, we had uh, assets owned by the family, but particularly car is a, a, one of those indicators that is uh, uh, useful in, based on our past uh, analysis and so on. So when we looked at the distribution of lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, and manganese, and aluminum in the cord blood, uh, so we needed to set some sort of references because even in the US, the cord blood is not really analyzed that much because either it's the cost or uh, the, so the data on understanding what's happening in the cord blood, uh, it's very, very limited. Uh, but for certainly for Jamaican, this was the first time that this data was coming out. And we have uh, argued that these data could be used as a reference uh, for the Jamaican population, newborns. So you get arithmetic means, and you have geometric means. Uh, and uh, those are, if it is skewed, the geometric means, and then you transform it back. So, uh, so those are this is reported here. So another um, characteristic is of the birth outcomes are also reported here. Um, by male and female, uh, by gender, and uh, so these levels are, uh, I hope uh, the expert in the field in Jamaica agree with these numbers because this came out of the J-Kids uh, study. Uh, so the univariable analysis uh, one thing that I want to acknowledge is this, that uh, we tried our best to look at these factors associated with these levels, but even a sample of 100 for some of them may not be sufficient. So statistical power may, may be limited, but uh, uh, at least it's, it was reasonable uh, to look at uh, some of these differences for lead and mercury, uh, you know, and its association with these characteristics to see whether they should be serving as a confounder or not. So the two things that they come up uh, uh, as uh, significant, maternal education was associated with the uh, aluminum levels. So, so I would like to clarify that when we did the R21 initially, when it started in 2009, aluminum was not in our radar to be analyzed to be even studied. 
We learned that uh, actually uh, aluminum levels are very high here because of the bauxite that you export to other countries and so on. So we added this as an important variable. So aluminum was, uh, levels of aluminum was associated with maternal education and uh, car ownership, which is an indicator of SES. You can see that uh, the levels are higher uh, in those who didn't have the car and those who had uh, education up to, uh, actually, education, it was higher in those who are up to high school education, lower education than uh, other group. So then we looked at the correlation. Uh, so the goal was to look at if, whether you can link to any of these variables to the uh, birth outcomes. And the only variable which showed up uh, to be significant was the lead levels. Uh, you know that lead is already known to be uh, not good in terms of growth and other issues and so on. So the lead uh, exposure was associated with head circumference. Uh, so that is the only variable which shows uh, significant. Uh, again, uh, there could, I would acknowledge that some of these could be also limited by our sample size. So when we went into multivariable analysis and we adjusted uh, for uh, SES and the maternal education, uh, we were still able to see that the head circumference was associated with lead levels in cord blood. So there is some borderline association uh, that is still, like if you see a p-value of 0.1, really you don't know where, which way it's going to go if you have a larger sample size. So. So you can see that gestational week, gestational age in weeks, uh, maybe associated with aluminum again, but we don't, the, that is uh, considered borderline uh, or marginally significant, point one. So, so I'm going to summarize the heavy metals, date, uh, some study component, sub-study, and then I will move on to do the PCBs. PCBs are more complex, and but I'll just uh, give you uh, a hint of what's happening in Jamaica with respect to exposure to PCBs and so on. So from the heavy metals data, we found significantly higher geometric mean cord blood aluminum concentration in newborns whose mother had a lower level of education, formal education, as well as those who were born to families with lower SES. So those are considered as potential risk factors for levels of aluminum in cord blood, uh, and perhaps educating mothers regarding sources of exposure to aluminum could potentially reduce levels of this toxin in Jamaican newborn. Our results indicate that cord blood lead concentration in Jamaican newborns are associated with head circumference after controlling for maternal education and SES, social economic status, However, we did, not, we did not find such association for concentration of any of the other five methods with, with the birth outcomes in our analysis. Okay, so moving on to the second study. Uh, so this time, our sample size is gonna be even smaller. Uh, one thing that we have learned about PCBs, and this was our first time that we were actually analyzing PCBs and. Uh, OC pesticides. Uh, so PCBs are have like 90 to 100 con congeners for each PCB. So there are lots of data, lots of variables. And we had to use uh, uh, some of these data were lipid adjusted analysis and some of them they were uh, not adjusted for up analyzed lipid. So we used the uh, expertise at the uh, uh, Michigan Department of Human and Health Services the, the lab that they were analyzing to really understand how these data need to be analyzed. Uh, so you will see data that they're lipid adjusted or they're not, and the same thing with the limit of detection, limit of uh, 
detection is calculated in a different way. Okay, so, so before I get into this complexity, I want to just tell you that the good news is this, that the levels, so the message that you need to take home today from this presentation is this, that Jamaican children and Jamaican families, you are exposed to higher levels of uh, heavy metals. The met heavy metals that we have measured in both studies, this one and previous studies that we have done, uh, you typically are two to four times higher in Jamaica as compared to the U.S. or Canada. And so the, your soil, uh, there's an atlas of, uh, as Professor Sams mentioned in her, in her presentation yesterday, there's an atlas of, uh, uh, of where these metals are. Uh, we did not, we have not analyzed actually, the, the, this university, UWI, had the center for I don't remember the name. Professor Layler was the director, and I don't know who is the new director. Uh, and they have thus contributed significantly to that understanding. The soil and other things have uh, these metals and so on. And we, we have reinforced that by looking at the blood of children and so on. But the good news is, is that PCBs and OC pesticides even are more uh, dangerous in terms of health impacts and so on. But Jamaican newborns and in the cord blood, we see lower levels of that. And the explanation that I will, we were able to provide in the, from the literature was this, that the sources of PCBs and, and some of these pesticides is from meat. And so we looked at the meat consumption of Jamaican as opposed to Canadian and US. And uh, so you consume less meat and more chicken. Chicken, chicken has PCBs and OC pesticides and so on, but it is lower level as compared to the meat. So we, we found that as a possible explanation as why we are seeing uh, lower levels of PCBs and so on. So, so you will see that in my analysis, a lot of these variables are gonna be below limit of detection. It's like you are paying $400 per sample to analyze, and then they say that, look, the level is so low that I cannot even give you the exact value. Uh, but anyway, uh, so you will see that there are some things that you may want to be concerned about, but in general, uh, from the PCBOC pesticide subcomponent of the study, uh, we were happy that the levels, actually, uh, the levels are not at the uh, dangerous level or something. So, so what we learned from this is this that, uh, so we had to, for analysis, we had to replace the limit of detection by half of LOD. So it's essentially it's between zero and LOD and you, the half point, the midpoint. Some people, they use the midpoint, some people, they use other factors, but for this study, we use the midpoint uh, to, for analysis. The standard deviations, uh, mean and standard deviations for the lipid adjusted concentration were assessed. Uh, so, and then concentration of DDE, you know, there was a time that when, when, when I was a kid, they said there was D DDT and there were all these things that were used for uh, pesticides control and all of that. All of these are dangerous material. And uh, this has been banned uh, for many, many years, even including in Jamaica, but they still, uh, they may be, first, they, once you get into your system, they stay there for 40 or 50 years. The half-life is very long. So that's why um, uh, the, still they show, even though they have controlled this, they still, uh, these are low. But DDE44 uh, was one of them uh, uh, that we wanted to further analyze, the one that, uh, that was more prevalent. And the linear regression that we use is the same thing that we used, but because we didn't have too many observations uh, with uh, above limit of detections, so we use below LOD versus above LOD, and that even reduces the power of the study. But anyway, we didn't have a choice, uh, and the reviewers of the journal wanted us to just present it, whatever it was, and uh, you will see that that, is a, that remains as a limitation that 
the, we don't have, we may not have a system called power to analyze the factors associated with these levels. So again, uh, there's a descriptive table of what shows uh, that this sample look like, okay, from type of children or in terms of their parents and family. Um, so then we have the same breakdown by gender in terms of the levels of your reporting, um, uh, median, and we are first quartile and third quartile, that's 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. And again, as I said, it's scary to go through every number. So you can see that the PCB congeners, that they were 100% below limit of detection. So the one that you see 100% below of the detection, that means they are pretty low. And the one that then you choose get into that 98%, eight, nine, so still they are really the levels are low. So that's why we had to do this uh, below or above limit of detection for some of this analysis. You don't have to see any numbers because really one city is saying the 100% below limit of detection, you're in a safe, you're in a good, good side. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so then we have this lipid adjusted concentration. Uh, so, so these are according to the formula that I showed you. Uh, these data are reported. Again, this could serve as a reference for your population, but uh, that's all uh, it's useful, could be useful now. Because some of our goals uh, may not be achieved in terms of being able to be finding what are the factors associated with this because the levels are very low. So as, you, as I said earlier, we, the analysis will concentrate on those being below LOD versus above LOD, and you look at their mean level and uh, and the p values are not significant, but uh, again it could be because of the sample size, but the differences are not that large either so that's it's a difficult thing to judge at this point with the data that we have so the conclusion for the sub study of the PCB and OC pesticide in the court serum is this that for ninety seven of the hundred PCB congeners, 16 of the seven, and 16 of the 17 OC pesticides, they were below LOD. So they were, as you can see, only a few of them uh, were above LOD. Uh, so that's a good news. Our results indicate that core serum concentration of PCB and OC pesticides in Jamaica and newborns are similar to or lower than levels of uh, levels reported for maternal blood in an earlier study from Jamaica Actually, there was a study from Caribbean that we have quoted in the paper, if you read it, and uh, f funded by Canadians, I guess, and from other studies in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we did not find a significant association between detectable levels of DDE in core blood serum and select birth outcome in Jamaican newborns. So these are the two important publications that you can uh, Download, these are free. You can go to the PubMed and you can click on it and they're available, accessible. So uh, these are the two publications that you've seen. So we have team, a team in, in Houston. Uh, so, and they're been acknowledged. So we have a genetic team that they were not involved. They were, they didn't have to do genetic analysis here. Uh, we didn't have that, but uh, they're part of our team. And this is the team at the University of West Indies. Uh, we have acknowledged uh, most of the people that they were uh, involved. Uh, I hope I've not missed any, anybody. And we have uh, Michigan State Department, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. These were the people that who were technical guys in terms of PCBs and OC pesticide paper to help us with understanding some of those numbers that they were providing. Uh, the funding acknowledgement is, uh, so we have had continuous funding from 2009 uh, for an R21 and an R01, which is ending, and we have another year of funding to finish that. 
uh, and some of the follow-up of the J kids is going to happen during this year. Uh, and then we have also a grant uh, from CTSA, they call Center for Clinical Transition Sciences, that we have used funding from that study uh, from time to time. So the IDB has been acknowledged for the GA kits component uh, of because GA kits study was crucial to this. And then we have to acknowledge that this the content is solely the responsibility of the authors and does not necessarily represent the official views of NICHC, uh, NIH, FIC is the Fogarty International Center and NIHS, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and NCRR is the one funding the CTSA grant and IDB uh, or the NCATS. So for those of you who have not been in Houston, uh, this is, do you see there are two kind of downtown areas? This is the largest medical center in the world. I don't know whether you have heard it before or not. So this is where our offices are. And the one in the back is commercial downtown. So we are proud of having the largest medical center in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Rabar. And we'll take questions at the end. And to remind you to tweet hashtag JAKids and also that the conference is being live streamed. I think you can just YouTube um, search JAKids. So our next presenter is from the Mona Geomatics, um, Geoinformatics Institute, and she's Mrs. Lisa Gay Green. She is currently Senior Pro Projects Manager at the Institute, which is located on the UWI campus, Mona campus, where she is responsible for overseeing the management of the Human and Social Mapping Department. Mrs. Green is a graduate of the UWI, where she completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in Geography, and then completed her Master's in Geographic Information Systems from Lund University in Sweden. Her active projects include overseeing the mapping um, and spatial analyses of major crimes, violence-related injuries from hospitals, other health data, and road crashes. She's also a member of the Violence Prevention Alliance and has had her work published in the Small Arms Survey and PLOS-1. Mrs. Green was a recipient of the 2013 FIA Road Safety Scholarship Program, where she pursued studies in road safety policy and promotion in London. And you'd have heard that the Geomatic Informatics Institute has done a lot of work with the JKIDS um, study, and so she's now going to present on GIS mapping and spatial analyses of JKIDS families. Welcome her. My fellow panelists, to, to you all, good afternoon. Let me first of all apologize for Dr. Paris Lewayi, who was not able to make it. He had an emergency meeting, and so he asked me to represent him here today. So for those who are not aware, Mona Geoinformatics is essentially a data company located here at the University of West Indies campus, Mona campus. And we specialize in spatial data mapping and analyses. We have over the years amassed one of Jamaica's largest spatial data banks, collecting data ranging from environmental data such as landslides, floods, rivers, rainfall, hurricanes, um, temperature data, also social and human um, data as well, looking at population distribution, density, employment, poverty, a whole range of um, data sets. We also look at infrastructural data, collecting road data, mapping all the bars, cemeteries, gas stations, schools, health centers, hospitals, you name it, we have mapped it. Um, we actually ventured into health GIS a couple years ago after signing an MOU with TMRU, which is now the Caribbean Institute of Health Research. And since then, we have worked on several projects that are health-related. Along with mapping the locations of diseases or patients, 
uh, we have looked at sickle cell mapping, mapping of patients with sickle cell um, disease. We have looked at mapping of mental health, mapping homeless persons across the island, also looking at mapping the respondents in the JHLS surveys, looking at non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases, and also looking at chikungunya. Those are some examples of the work that we have done over time. But today, I'll be focusing on the work we've done with the JA Kids Project. Some of you may be aware of John Snow, who many years ago would have mapped um, persons who are afflicted with cholera. And in mapping those persons, he was then able to pinpoint the source of cholera. So what we have been trying to do over the years is use Geographic Information Systems, GIS, to map diseases, map patients, map health facilities, and see the linkages, the spatial linkages between all these factors or features. So you can look at the spatial factor and also the temporal factors, mapping populations at risk, and also looking at, at how the environment themsel itself impacts on the distribution of these diseases. So we were given the task of looking at not only mapping the locations of the mothers that are involved in the study, the birth cohort study, but looking at the environments in which they reside. We were given about 7,015 7, mothers to map, of which 6,101 were mapped, and we were able to link these mothers to the health centers that they went for prenatal care. So here I have a map of Jamaica. Each dot represents the location of each of the mothers that we were able to map for the study. So one dot represents one mother. We were also able to get the data at the community scale, identifying which communities had most mothers that were a part of the study. So we're seeing those areas in red um, would have been Linstead and um, Old Harbour, and also Spanish Town would have had the most mothers that were recorded for this, that were included in the study. So we're fortunate for this study to have received specific home locations for each mother, because unfortunately we oftentimes hear results or data at the parish level or the region scale. But for this study, it was very good that we were able to map or pinpoint exactly where these mothers lived. And that provided us the opportunity to do a more um, detailed look at each of these mothers. So we can do street level analysis. So as with John Snow, we can identify mothers based on the streets they live on. We can bump it up some more to the neighborhood or the community that they're residing. We can go to the constituency, health region, or parish scale. But the good thing, as I said, is that the granularity of this data really allowed us to do a lot of um, analysis. So before the study was actually done, we were asked to make a simple map, looking at where were a lot of our children being found. So the areas you're seeing in orange and red represent those communities where more than 30% of the population in those communities were under the age of 15. As you can see, it's not uniform across the island. If you look at the inset map to the bottom, that'll be your right, that's the corporate area, you'll see that those areas, um, which we consider as it were uptown, had um, lesser or lower percentages of children, while those areas to the south along the Spanish Town Road corridor had more incidents of um, children being present in those areas. Again, this has implications as to the type of medical services you may provide, maybe more prenatal um, facilities could be in these areas, different, different, um, I guess analysis could be done to determine what measures could be taken based on the data presented here. So back to the JA Kids data, each dot here represents the location of a health center. So the larger the circle, it represents that most of these, most of the mothers that attended or went to this health center traveled further distances. The smaller the circle, the opposite. And so we're able to look at not just where the mother lives, how far, but also how far they traveled to get health care. For this map, it's a bit crowded, but it shows all the mothers. Again, this time, um, their home locations, the larger the circle, it, it indicated how far they traveled to get health care, in this case, prenatal, prenatal care. So with the distance matrix that we did, we were able to, um, and, uh, to determine that about 7,585 meters is the average distance that mothers traveled to get health care. And you can then determine which health care is in particular had the, I guess, the smallest service area, which ones had the larger service areas. Now, we can't explain why a mother would, per se, pass two health centers to get to another one. Maybe has loyalty to a particular doctor, more services, so whatever the incident, whatever the case is. But we're able to determine from the data, you know, which, which what, what the service areas for each of the health centers was. We would have also worked with um, Trevor, 
Travis Hughes from University of Michigan looking at the relationship between where the mothers lived and also heavy metals. Um, Layla, in his geochemistry atlas of Jamaica, he would have mapped the concentrations of, in particular, cadmium, arsenic, and lead were used for this study. And it was found that mothers who had babies with a low birth weight actually were, was, there was a high relationship with heavy concentration of these three metals. So recently we were asked to now look at the movements of mothers. After five years, have the mothers moved? Where have they moved to? So it's a Jamaica scale. Lots of movements into parish, intra parish over that five year period. Zooming in on Kingston, Spanish Town, lots of movements happening there. So they have moved, and we were able to, to map a subset of the total. So, a subset, so about 865 mothers were mapped of that total. 291 moved, 261 remained in their, their, um, at the same address, and a few of them we were not able to map. Some of them migrated, and so forth. So having mapped the movement, the mothers, you know where they moved to, we're then able to see what was the kind of relationship in terms of where they're moving to, the socioeconomic background as to the communities they're moving from and moving to. So we did urban and rural um, analysis. So we found that most of the mothers migrated from urban to urban. That is, if you're living in Kingston, you go somewhere else in Kingston, or from Kingston to Montego Bay. Um, we found that there was also, of course, urban rural and rural urban migrations, which were lower numbers. Of course, persons who moved from urban areas to rural areas traveled greater distances. So an example we saw where a mother moved from Montego Bay to Moran Bay, which would be considered urban urban. And we also saw that there are some persons who moved within the communities in which they live. All right, so with all the data we have been collecting over the years, we can identify which areas are considered poor based on poverty data, based on income proxy data. And so we're able to identify which mothers or how many mothers were moved from one community to a, a poorer community or to a less poor community. And we saw here that 103 mothers moved to what were considered poor communities and 112 mothers moved to less poor communities. And of course, you can break this down to look at income versus poverty versus access to particular healthcare, different levels could be used to determine what's considered poor. And that was told at 15 minutes, as so I'm kind of rush, rushing through it. Um, in conclusion, what we have found is that we have mapped lots of data, patients, um, location, diseases, health facilities, and what we have done is to be, add that spatial context to that data. And what we, have allowed, what we have found is that it allowed medical professionals to focus more on um, what the data was showing, so it's more evidence-based. And so as I mentioned before, you would know the service area of a health center. And you may then need to wonder why is this particular health center having such a wide service area versus another one. So with that kind of analysis, I allowed medical professionals, in this particular case, JA kids, to dig deeper to find out why those incidents are occurring. And um, with the incorporation of non-medical data, so you would not know, so Many of you may be involved in research, and you may have the location of a patient or a respondent. We can add some depth and analysis to that data. So that mother who's a point on the map who has three children, she, we need to find out, for example, is she located close to a bauxite plant? Is that impacting her health outcome in some way? Is she located in an agricultural area, so her lifestyle or eating habits may be different from someone who lives in an urban area? We may also be looking at um, what is the crime situation in the, co in the community the person lives, what's that impact on their lifestyle habits. So with the, the data, the broad range of data that we have, we've been able to plug it into whatever research data available and to provide that context. And as I mentioned, we're fortunate for the JA Kids Project to have had pinpoint or ad um, address locations for the mothers. And most of our products do not um, allow for that. Most of them are samples. So I encourage you, if you can, or other persons who are interested in doing this kind of research to, to really focus on doing comprehensive mapping if possible, because it provides greater depth to your analysis. And I will end by just saying thank you, congratulations as well to Professor Sam Vaughan, Dr. Cordes Sire and the team for the hard work that you've been doing and for including us, including us in this project. Thank you.
Thanks, Mrs. Green, for that very um, interesting presentation. Our next speaker will be Dr. Rebecca Tor Tortello. Um, Dr. Tortello um, has regularly lectured at the UWI in the Department of Education and has also worked with the Jamaican government as senior advisor consultant to the Minister of Education, directed the Spanish Jamaican Foundation, and now works with UNICEF as the education specialist in the Jamaica country office. She holds a PhD in comparative education and sociology from Columbia University, a master's in teaching and curriculum from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and a bachelor's degree with honors in history and literature. She's the author, editor of a number of children's books and educational articles, and the popular history book, Pieces of the Past, A Stroll Down Jamaica's Memory Lane. So today she's going to speak to us on Breast is Best, Jamaican Attitudes to Infant Nutrition. Thank you, Dr. Melbourne Chambers. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the team and to say how honored I am to be a, me a pseudo member of the team um, as, a, as a person who sat on the steering committee and has now been able to be part of the research writing team. Um, I would also like to thank um, Jody and Mia and Roseanne for their help with the data because it's been a long time since I've really been able to look at data and try to analyze it sitting in an office at UNICEF. I don't get to do that as much as I would like and so this is a great return to many years ago when I was studying in New York. Um, I also want to give a shout out to my colleague from UNICEF, Donneth Edmondson, who is an m and &E guru and I'm very grateful for her help. So today, my presentation, and I'm gonna try to keep on time and not hold you up, because I know we're nearing lunch and you all are probably hungry, um, is really focusing on infant nutrition and what is a global issue of concern, which is breastfeeding, and particularly exclusive breastfeeding. It's a global area of concern for UNICEF. Um, it's an issue that is part of our country program, and it's aligned to the, uh, the concept of baby-friendly hospitals. So when this study was conducted in 2011 and the data was collected, most of our public hospitals would not have been recognized or had achieved, held onto that certification of being baby-friendly. Being baby-friendly requires you to follow 10 steps that are um, shared by WHO and UNICEF and have a lot to do with promotion and facilitation of exclusive breastfeeding. So I'm gonna go through and explain what exclusive breastfeeding means as well, and let's see. So just to give you some background to breastfeeding and EBF, less than half of the world's newborns benefit from this cost-effective and impactful intervention. That might be shocking, less than half of the world's newborns. So there's some statistics I'm gonna share that speak to the benefit to the mother and the benefit to the child. Of course, I'm gonna bring in the SDGs because I work with the UN. So this is related to USDG3 and the right to nutrition is protected by international human rights law and the Convention on the Rights of the Child to which Jamaica is a signatory. What does the policy say? It recommends exclusive breastfeeding up to six months, which is possible except for a few rare medical conditions. So the global public health recommendation says our infants should be exclusively breastfed to achieve optimal growth, development, and health. And this is echoed in our own national infant and young child feeding policy. So the global breastfeeding, the global situation is that the major, all of our infants would, would benefit from immediate breastfeeding within an hour after birth, and this is one of the criteria for being a baby-friendly hospital, because it would significantly reduce neonatal mortality. Exclusively breastfed children have at least six times a greater chance of survival in the early months than non-breastfed children, six times. Yet only 39% of children less than six months old in the developing world are exclusively breastfed. So EBF means giving an infant exactly what it says, only breast milk for the first six months of life, no other food, no water, which is a Jamaican practice. We like to give baby water, our baby's water. Now listen to these numbers. If you practice EBF, research has told us, this comes from the Lancet, can prevent potentially 1.4 million deaths every year among children under five out of the annual 10 million deaths. 
It has the single largest potential impact on child mortality of any preventive intervention. Over one third of under five mortality is caused by undernutrition in which poor breastfeeding practices and inadequate complementary feeding, which is what we do, we do complementary feeding, plays a major role. It's part of optimal feeding practices. So now to tell you a little bit about the Jamaican situation, I used two sets of data. One is the JA Kids data and one is data from the multiple indicator cluster survey which just happened to be taken both in 2011. So that was lucky for me. Um, for our, from our standpoint, from the mixed data, we know that 95% of our babies have been breastfed at some point. 64.7 started early, but only 23.8 were exclusively breastfed up to six months. There are different potential reasons for that, which I will get into in a little bit. Only 44% continue to have any breastfeeding at all, up to one year, and I believe there's data in the exhibition over there that shows us what our children are actually being given to drink and eat as, we, as they get older with high incidences of access to sugary liquids and salty foods. Only 42.5% were predominantly breastfed under six months. Predominantly breastfed means both breast and bottle. And when I say bottle here, I mean formula, not breast milk in a bottle. So complementary feeding started at six months along with continued breastfeeding is ranked at number three in terms of its impact on reducing child mortality. Breast milk provides, as you know, all the essential nutrients. Now I know we all know that breastfeeding is good. And actually the Jamaican mothers, what we looked at, the study that I looked at, was the prenatal questionnaire, my pregnancy, what I plan to do, et cetera. And I, this study also allowed us to look at the thoughts of fathers, which is critical. We've never had that access before. So this slide gives you some of the, a graphic of some of the benefits of breastfeeding. How many of you knew that exclusive breastfeeding would lead to less air infections? Raise your hands. That's more than I thought. I didn't know that. How many of you knew that exclusive breastfeeding would is linked to lower risk of obesity for the child. Okay, how many of you knew that it was linked to lower risk of maternal cancers, ovarian and breast cancer? You all are so well informed in here. A lot of hands are going up. Okay, I'm gonna give you non-breast children, non-breastfed children have a 250%, that's a big number, higher risk of being hospitalized for pneumonia and asthma. Asthma is a major childhood illness in Jamaica. Non-breastfed children have a 60% higher risk of recurrent air infections. EBF can prevent SIDS. The longer duration can lead to improved cognitive performance and educational achievement at age five. Did any of you know that one? Okay. It also decreases certain childhood cancers. And did you know that it can also potentially decrease, less, uh, increase dental health, less cavities, less need for braces? You knew that? It didn't work for me with my children, but anyway. <laughs> Exclusively breastfed children have, sem more numbers, 72% lower risk of lower respiratory tract infections, 64%, these are high percentages, 64% lower rate of gastrointestinal infections, again with the air infection, 50% less, 42% for asthma and diabetes and obesity. For the mother now, we already, you're all so knowledgeable about this, you know about ovarian and premenopausal breast cancer. Did you know that it was also helpful in preventing osteoporosis? Oh, that one. I got you with that one. It enjoys a quicker recovery after childbirth, we knew that. It decreases insulin requirements in diabetic mothers. Of course, there's this belief that if you breastfeed, breastfeed you will snap right back to your pre-pregnancy weight. That also did not work for me. For the first uh, six months postpartum, it also helps in preventing additional pregnancies. Now, obviously we know that breastfeeding helps to promote a bonding between mother and child, and uh, exclusively breastfed mothers are reported to be more confident, calm, and less anxious, which can then lead to calmer babies, which is an important finding. So, here we have Shelly Ann Fraser Price, who is recognizable to all of you. She's a UNICEF, uh, Global Amb uh, UNICEF Jamaica ambassador, and we have been using her, we plan to be using her in a campaign to help advocate for more breastfeeding and for exclusive breastfeeding. Looking at the data, we had about 4,000 mothers, it's, it's a little bit less than that, 52% were under 25 years old, 75% of them in the JA kids sample had completed both primary and secondary, only 0.1% had a tertiary degree, 20 of them had a doctoral degree. So if you look at these bar charts now with the colors, you see at the bottom 
the overall, all the mothers overall, and then you look at the mothers under 25 right above and the mothers over 25. And what you notice is the, they're pretty similar. So these mothers, the turquoise color is who planned, who said they planned to breastfeed at birth. The overall mothers, 94%. In the first month to be still breastfeeding, 84.7%. And in the third month, 624 So it goes down. We didn't ask them what they planned to do at six months, and there were, obviously there were limitations in the, the frequency with which the team could contact the, the, the mothers. I know they had wanted to, but it didn't work out that way. And I think three months is telling, because in Jamaica our laws are that you have two months of paid maternity leave and one month of unpaid maternity leave, so hence probably the choice for three months. Of those who were participating in the sample, 69.5% of them said they would go back to work. So that gives us the indication that 70% of them were employed at the time of the study. And most of them will say that's the sort of orangey, yellowy color, um, would go back during the time period of exclusive breastfeeding. Again, be probably because of the way our maternity and paternity leave uh, laws exist, and so that's a definite policy implication. Again, I, uh, the input of the father. So looking at this, you look at the father's views on breastfeeding versus the mother. So 63, and you, what you see is that mothers overestimated what fathers would say about breast milk. So 63.5% of the mothers said the fathers would prefer the baby to be fed with breast milk. That's an interesting finding. Only 44.5% of the fathers said that they would prefer that. 18.6% of mothers said the fathers would say they could use both the bottle and the breast, but only 51.9% but 51 of the fathers said both. So what you see coming out here is that for fathers, it's kind of okay, 51.9. They're okay with breastfeeding and they're okay with bottle feeding. And culturally, we have believed that fathers tend to support bottle feeding because it's a way that they can contribute. They can buy the bottles, they can buy the formula, and so there's an element of I'm the man in the house and I'm contributing. But 69% of the fathers said breastfeeding almost never made it or did not really make it difficult for them to bond. 69% is a high percentage. And 89% of the fathers said breastfeeding did not reduce attractiveness. You know, that shouldn't really be important, but anyhow, culturally, that is, <laughs> that is important because when you hear, when we have breastfeeding week, which is in September nationally, and people are speaking on call-in shows, you do hear fathers, you always have one father that will say, something like, or one man that will say something like that. Then we were able to ask them, do you think, a series of questions, both the mother and the father, do you think breastfeeding curtails the mother's freedom? They were pretty equal on that. They both, 87% of the fathers said, yes, it, it uh, almost never, they, they would still be able to do what they wanted to do, and 80% 80 80 of the mothers said the same thing. Do they believe that breastfeeding creates a bond between mother and child? Again, very close at, in, the high 90, in the 90s for both mother and father agreeing, yes, it creates a bond. Is breastfeeding better than formula? Look at the numbers, 96.5 for the father, 95.3. So there is an agreement. We know breastfeeding is better, but why are we, why do we drop off? Um, does the father think that the bottle allows him to share more uh, in the care of the baby? Yes, 70% of them, but still, 96.5% of them say that breastfeeding is better. Um, are you a bad mother if you don't, if you don't breastfeed? Fathers, 71.4%. Mothers, 62.6%. Interesting findings. So they are, they're pretty much in agreement on most of these. What's also interesting news and important, because as you've heard from the data shared yesterday and the day before, the healthcare system is the go-to place for information, for parenting, education, and support. And so here, 72.8% of the mothers said that they gave them information. They received spontaneous information on the importance of breastfeeding. What I wonder is if they understand, the, the, the population understands just how important it is. We know that they, we understand it's important, but maybe if we understood how important it is, we would try it to stay with it a little bit longer. Um, I also note that because most of the mothers had up, received up to a secondary level education, clearly they're also getting information in their schools. So something is going on, that's a good thing. HFLE, we don't know exactly where they're getting the information, but somewhere we're getting 90% of the people saying we know breast is best. But why are we not continuing? It's not a one woman job, this just goes back to the SDGs. It requires government leadership, it requires support from families, communities, workplaces, and that's where we really tend to to fall off is in the support in the workplace as well. 
So there are two main challenges, and I'm closing now, in Jamaica that I could see from this data. One is our cultural practices. We have a belief that mixed feeding is okay. It's, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, but it's not the best thing, according to the research. The belief that it makes women less attractive is not holding up, so there's no reason for men not to support their wives or their partners in, in breastfeeding. And believe me, women need support because it's not easy for everybody. Um, and there's, there is a father, there's still a father preference for the bottle, but they still acknowledge that breastfeeding is, is best. So there's mixed messages there. So the, the data from JA Kids has indicated that some of the cultural practices are not insurmountable, but we do need more data. We need to know what stops our mothers from breastfeeding between, exclusively breastfeeding between three and six months. Return to work is another, is the second challenge, and this is where I want to show you a short clip. It's less, it's about a minute. It's from Shelly Ann Fraser Price speaking about her, one of her experiences as a breastfeeding mother. And I know that, there we go. It's coming up now. Thank you. So Shelly Ann is talking about what every mother would wish they could do, slip out at lunch and be able to feed their baby. We don't have that capacity to do that. We don't have transportation systems that would necessarily make that easy. We don't have, um, we don't have in our offices, neither in the government, in the UN, in the private sector, spaces that you can go to pump, if you have a pump to pump, um, and you can afford the bottles, to have the breast milk um, stored in a clean space, in a separate refrigerator probably. And that's something that we can look at in terms of policy because it's, we as the UN, we have a small breastfeeding space because we just had one of our colleagues who had a baby, but we didn't really have it before that, to tell you the truth. So, and the whole UN doesn't have that. So that's something that we need to advocate for. Um, we need to advocate, as I said earlier, for a longer paid maternity leave and for these breastfeeding spaces and breaks. And we need, Yes, we do. I don't know who to speak to, but I think we can use this data to, <laughs> to try. Um, we also need to mount more public education campaigns and awareness, like using Shelly Ann and other influencers to talk about the importance of family and community support. And we need to work on building capacities, the implement, implement, finalization and implementation of the Infant and Young Child Feeding Program, ongoing training for health and community workers, and for those doctors in the audience here who have power to consider potentially including a more emphasis on the benefits of breastfeeding and the importance of EBF in the pre-service section of medical training. Mother-to-mother um, -mother support groups, workplace support, m &E, because data-driven decision-making is so critical as I mentioned, awareness campaigns, and then BFHI, which is the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. We now have two. In 2011, we had zero public hospitals. And when Jamaica reports as a country to the Con Committee on the Rights of the Child, they always ask, what's up with the lack of baby friendly hospitals? No, in 2012, we had zero. Now we have two, and we have a few more that are poised to be able to achieve that recognition. So that's, that's the good news, and I think um, grateful for the data, I'm grateful for the chance to, to get back a little bit into research, and I think that these are some low-hanging fruits that we can really achieve in terms of better supporting our mothers to achieve EBF, and then we can look at the potential better outcomes for our children, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. So our next um, presenter is Mrs. Vanessa White Barrow, 
Um, she's a registered nutritionist and senior lecturer at the University of Technology, Jamaica, in the College of Health Sciences. Uh, Mrs. White Barrow is currently pursuing a PhD in nutrition, but has an MSc degree in nutrition and a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry and zoology from the University of the West Indies, Mona, as well as a diploma in science education from the Shortwood Teachers College. She's a licensed primary sports nutritionist and a master sports nutritionist, and her research interests include eating disorders and adolescent eating behaviors, sports nutrition, and science education. Let us welcome Mrs. White Barrow as she speaks to us on children's nutrition in Jamaica. Again, thank you. Um, good afternoon and congratulations to the JA Kids team on the wonderful work that they have done and I really want to thank them for the opportunity to joining, join the team in looking at the dietary data um, that was collected as part of the 2011 Jamaica um, Earth Cohort Study. Now, I will continue on the focus, continue the focus on child nutrition, but this time I want to focus a little bit more on the controver um, slightly controversial um, food items that, you know, we focus quite a bit when it comes on to child nutrition, especially in Jamaica and other developing countries, that of the consumption of sugar and salty foods and this data is especially important because we really don't, and we haven't had for quite uh, many years, nationally representative data on the consumption of these kinds of foods among our young children. So I'll quickly just do a brief background and then talk about the method. And most of the presentation will, of course, focus on the results and talk about the implications and also make reference to some recommendations. So we know that the first five years of a child's life is important, not just because this stage involves rapid growth and development, but also it is at this time that their eating behaviors can serve as a foundation for future eating patterns. We also know that in this age group, we tend to have higher rates of undernutrition attributed to by nutrient deficiencies and illnesses, as well as dietary excesses, which we now recognize as um, a manifestation of the consumption of added sugars in the form of, in form of sugar-sweetened beverages, sweet snacks, and salty snacks as well. And these are associated with increased trend, trends in childhood obesity and related chronic non-communicable diseases. So we took an interest in this data because it would allow us to assess firsthand the consumption of these food items as well as salty snacks among the 9 to 54 month cohort in Jamaica. The data was collected, the dietary data that we were interested in, was collected from the mothers of about 4,589 children who participated in the study. And the data was collected when the children were nine months, 18 months, and about 54 months. Now at nine months, the mothers were asked simply whether or not they consumed these foods. And the news was good. With respect to fruit consumption, we were seeing that about 70% of the nine-month-old were, we were being told, were actually consuming fruits. Vegetables, about 94% of the mothers were saying that their children were consuming vegetables. We were slightly concerned, though, but slightly happy that 
most of the mothers, about 64%, were saying that their child were not consuming soft drinks, but 34% in our estimation is too high for a nine-month um, cohort. With respect to sweet snack consumption, about 73% of the mothers were saying that their child or children were consuming sweet snacks. And with respect to salty snacks, about 75% of the mothers reported that their child or children were consuming salty snacks. So this is at nine months. A similar question was asked when the mothers were um, interviewed about the consumption of foods by their 18-month-old. And again, the story was good. With respect to their fruit and fruit juice consumption, about 99% of the mothers said that their child had consumed fruit. And again, very good news with respect to vegetable consumption, about 98% of the mothers said that their child was consuming vegetables. However, we were concerned that about 83% of the mothers, when asked about box drink consumption, were saying that their child was consuming box drink at 18 months. With respect to soda consumption, again, we're seeing that about 51% were saying that their child was consuming soda at 18 months. With respect to sweet snack consumption, again, we're seeing about 85% of the mothers saying that their child was consuming sweet snacks. With salty snacks, we're seeing a similar trend. About 92% of the mothers were reporting that their child was consuming salty snacks. Now, at 54 months, the, the questions that were asked were slightly different. They were asked not just about whether or not their child was consuming the food, but they were also asked about how frequently the children were consuming these foods. Again, we're seeing that on a daily basis, most of the mothers were consuming fruits and vegetables for on a daily basis. Um, with respect to vegetables, we're getting this kind of data from about 60% of the mothers. And over 70% of the mothers were saying that their child was consuming fruits. An important question that was asked, and I think this was um, important because in some studies, sometimes we're not really sure whether the mothers are thinking about fruit juice as real fruit or just general fruit drink. So in this study at 54 months, they were asked about the consumption of real fruit juice. And here we're seeing that about 45% of the mothers were saying that their child were drinking fruit juice on a daily basis. When we look at trends with respect to the consumption of these foods between two to four days per week or one or less day per, um, per day per week, we're seeing that there is a reduction, of course. But what was interesting was that with respect to fruit consumption, actually eating fruits, among your 54 year olds who are going now to age five, we're seeing that only about eight to nine percent of the children are consuming fruit um, once or less per week. When we look at the consumption of added sugar, defined in terms of sweet drinks, sodas, and sweet snacks, we're seeing that over 42% of the mothers were saying that their child were having sweet drinks um, on a daily basis. 
and only about 15% were having sodas on a daily basis, which in my estimation is still a little too high. And about 48% were having sweet snacks on a daily basis. 17% of the mothers were saying that they were having sweet drinks, sodas, or sweet snacks between two to four days per week. But having it for one or less week um, per day, sorry, per week, we're seeing that about 68% of the mothers were saying that fruits were consumed one or less um, times per week. With respect to salty snack consumption, this was also concerning. With respect to daily consumption at four years, six months, about 62% of the mothers reported that their child was consuming salty snacks on a daily basis. And we saw this trend from nine months. So having looked at this data, and this is still preliminary, we haven't really teased out you know, any adjust adjustments with respect to their socioeconomic status or even their education level. But generally, we're seeing those kinds of trends that we're seeing in the adolescent and adult population emerging already. So yes, the fruit and vegetable consumption, while commendable, is still of concern, especially in the context where adults are reported to be consuming less consuming um, fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. Also, the level of added sugar in the form of our box drinks, which many of the times we don't even know the levels of sugar in these food items. Um, salty snacks, sodas, the levels of added sugar in forms of these foods is of concern. And these trends are indication are indications of potentials for future increases in childhood and adult obesity, as well as increases in cardiovascular disease conditions such as hypertension. So the need for strengthening and continued preaching of public messages targeting increased fruit and vegetable consumption is underscored by these data. And we're seeing the need more and more to encourage our mothers, caregivers, to focus on home preparation of snacks, which involve fruits, vegetables, even dairy. And with a tropical climate like ours, thinking about cooling, using water, and even infused water, since we've become so accustomed to sweet beverages as our preferred choice for cooling, um, infused water and real fruit juice consumption needs to be encouraged for our younger children. Again, want to acknowledge the work done by the research team and the, fa the families who participated in this study and the, main, the various funding agencies as well as my admin support who helped at the last minute to put this presentation together. Hope we've managed to get back on track for lunch, which is now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. White Barrow. I'm going to invite you back here with Professor Rabar. Right, right, great. Dr. Um, Tortello and Mrs. Green. Okay, so I think we should have some roving microphones and uh, just ask you to indicate um, your question. So first of all, there's a question at the back. That's Dr. Gordon Veach. 
And while the microphone is going, I wanted to ask Dr. Tertel if she knew from the study what was the influence of the grandmothers and the female relatives on breastfeeding. Because in my practice, grandmothers love to feed babies cornmeal porridge and they can't wait. So. There we go. Um, we didn't run that, but that's a good point. Um, so it's possible to get that data. And you're right. I mean, I know when I had my children, my mother was telling me to give them water, all, like frequently. I, I don't. I don't know if they got water when I had to right. leave them there. <laughs> so. Good. Guest Doctor Beach. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Gordon Veach, pediatric dentist. I have been in practice for 37 years. I've been a pediatric dentist for over 30. And Dr. Tortello. You see how it didn't work with my children? I know, I know. She's but my here's dentist. the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. Exclusive breastfeeding is great. However, we have a problem with the pattern of breastfeeding because what happens is I definitely am not seeing where it's protecting the children from caries. It's quite the opposite. Because every week in our practice, we see a child who is exclusively breastfed over a certain age. Like we would try to get them off, wean them by like a, a year. Because what is happening is we're seeing early childhood caries but because of in children who are exclusively breastfed. So it's definitely not protecting them from caries. If they are falling asleep with the breast bottle, or juices or anything that they have, they must brush their teeth first, brush their teeth last thing at night, and that's it. After that, nothing except water. Because we're seeing the children every week. It, and it, it's critical because we have to get all the healthcare um, participants, all healthcare givers, all the professionals involved in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in imparting the knowledge. Because the, 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 I'm seeing the little ones come in as early as 14 months, we have to do general anesthesia on these babies because we've, we've lost, they've lost their, all the front teeth. They're not going to um, grow back until they're seven. And it's distressing and it's not protecting them from caries. It is not. If, if they breastfeed or they have any sort of sugar because breast milk has sugar in it, especially the night feeding. So we, we were trying to let them brush the teeth and then that's it. So I'm just letting you know that it's not protecting them from that. So I don't know, I don't know where that data is coming from, but in our, our, our studies and in our recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatric Dentists, et cetera, breast milk is one of the um, cariogenic liquids that causes caries. Interesting. Okay. okay. So I think, um, you gonna respond? I'm not going to argue with my dentist. No. <laughs> um, I can look back and see where the source of that, that slide and that data came from. But um, I mean, that's an important point. I don't, nobody mentioned that to me when I was feeding my child. Um, and I, I mean, the point is that we are not, our Jamaican children are, are not being exclusively breastfed up to six months. Only 23.8% of them are. So that's actually not impacting whatever, it might not be impacting whatever you see, but they're being given other things. Um, in the night and so on, I guess, I don't know what they're being fed in the night because we didn't ask those questions, bottles or okay. bush tea or whatever, so. I think the clear message Dr. Gordon Veach you want is that to spread the, yeah. the infant should not be going to sleep on the breast and that the mouth must be cleaned before going to sleep because I yeah. think probably that is the issue. Yeah. So it's not the breastfeeding but the pattern. Right. Pardon me? No, but, but I'm. But not, they're not doing it. I'm not hearing. Hi. Hmm. It's not about um, not brushing the teeth. It's about um, feeding right. through the night. So right. in other words, it's the milk. Yes. That's we're having the problem right. with feeding through the night. So breast milk is great, but I, we have five-year-olds on the breast. 
No, but they're I not mean, exclusively because we said dot, on dot, the dot, breast. And beyond. Beyond? Right. No, but at night is what you're talking about. Because they wouldn't be only breast milk fed at five years old. They're eating other foods, but it's the right. night feeding. That night feeding speaking. period. Right. right. But I mean, breast milk does cause caries. It does not protect them from That's caries. Right. Okay. All right. Um, Mrs. White. Okay. All right, Mrs. White Morris. Um, in relation to Jamaica moves and the figures that you were showing, could you do probably it's in the making coming up? What is there? Did you see a correlation with a lot of the the, the sugary stuff we are eating and the weight that the children have going forward? Right, that's for future research. Um, the data is available, and those are some of the things that we intend to look at. Um, with respect to the Jamaica Moves campaign, since you raised it, um, I know for the older children in the primary schools, you know, the prep schools, there is going to be an initiative to extend that campaign um, to encourage not just increased physical activity, but also looking at the nutrition component with respect to the consumption of these foods. Um, however, in terms of what is happening at the, pre the preschool level, um, I guess, you know, we really haven't heard a conversation about a more targeted approach, you know, with respect to encouraging our, we just take it for granted that our children are playing. But, you know, when you have a culture such as ours, where people have a way of telling children, you know, um, you know, just keep yourself quiet because I'm tired. I want to rest. You know, these are kind of the things that will be reinforced over time that we need to monitor. So um, I still believe that it's not just about physical activity, but also nutrition. You know, the good thing is we have the Early Childhood Commission with a framework already in place with those standards that we just need to make sure are being enforced um, in the preschool culture. But I think that framework is already there. Okay, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna take three more questions. First, um, Prof. Iman, do you want to, probably could borrow this microphone. Yeah, I, I just want to reinforce the point about salt because um, in, in our SPAC, uh, in, in the UK, we looked at salt intake in, in the first 12 months, and it correlated directly with blood pressure at 8. And blood pressure at 8 correlates directly with blood pressure at 50. So I think in, in the Jamaican context, there's got to be a very clear message that no salt for, for infants. Mm -hmm. So that means not only not giving them salty foods, but not giving them food from the family pot, which has got high levels of salt in. So it seems to me the, the, the situation just repeats itself because infants are exposed. And, they and the killer fact is that you develop your taste for salt by the age of 12 months. Okay, I hope you heard Prof. Eamon talk about the family part, which <laughs> I think means that he's been here for a while. So coming to you, one more. Hi, um, this question is for Dr. Tartello and Mrs. White Barrow. I was just interested about the, um, the nutri as we're talking about exclusive breastfeeding, I'm, I'm just wondering about the nutrition of the mother and, and her actual food intake. Um, is her f intake sugary? Um, you know, what is her nutritional level like and how does that affect the breast milk for the child? All right, um, that data is also available. Um, they did 24 hour recall data with the mothers. And yes, we do look forward to that analysis. So we know that, you know, it will tell another story that may answer. <laughs> okay, and our final question for this session. So Cynthia Hobbs from the IDB. Um, the focus has really been on nutrition, but as an education specialist, I've visited dozens of schools across the island. And I'm now understanding why the children always go for the sweets and the salty snacks at the tuck shop. 
I've only visited one school on the whole island that's exclusively sold healthy foods. So the question would be how to convey this message to the Ministry of Education so we can change the foods that are available to the children at the schools. Okay. Um, that's an important question, and I know that... Again, as part of the Jamaica Moves campaign, that initiative, um, there is a new school nutrition, well, we've never had a school nutrition policy in place before. Um, I was part of the team that was developing, well, in terms of a school level policy. Well, the history is, I know. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ashley. <laughs> yes. So, but a revised policy, therefore, is supposed to be in, in place. Um, and as part of the, the team that was um, doing that initial development, also I know that it was a collaboration between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education. So, we in you know, we really look forward to the kind of results um, that this will show with respect to changes in child nutrition going forward at that level. Good. Thank you. I want to thank our presenters and to thank you also for a very engaging and lively session. I have about five things to tell you. One is that the, we're going to project the link for live streaming. So you will be able to watch and re-watch um, sessions and catch up on sessions you may have missed. We're going to go to lunch now and reconvene at 2.30. Don't forget during your lunch time to visit the exhibit which is in the hall to our, my left here, your right. And I think Prof Sam just wanted to let our dentists know that there, yeah, she's happy to have you in the audience. Lots, um, they have collected data on dental care throughout the cohort, so we can look forward to um, some good um, data from um, on dental care from that. So again, thank you for your participation. Enjoy lunch, and see you back at two thirty.